Um, Maybe the end. Yeah, potentially. Yeah. Um, all right, let's let's get going. I'll let you know once we hit quorum then. Okay. Thanks. All right. Welcome everybody. Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon. Whatever it is, wherever you are. Um, so on today's agenda, we have our usual hackfest planning topic. Just a reminder of uh, that again. We'd like to get the registration uh, and a draft agenda. Uh, going. I do have, uh, I, I, I haven't done it this morning, but I do have, uh, there's, a, there's a conference going on uh, concurrent with the Hackfest. Uh, I was asked to speak and give a keynote, but I think there's opportunity for other people to do panels and so forth. And I will share the call for participation uh, on the mailing list um, for that. Um, and then Todd, you want to, uh, actually, let me just sort of review the rest of this. So we have quarterly project updates. We have Quilt. I think I saw Adrian on. Hello, Adrian. Uh, and then next week is Fabric. Oh, great. Um, maybe I can get somebody else to do it. Uh, and then we have the Identity Working Group um, uh, update. Uh, we will finalize the discussion regarding uh, achieving 1.0 before leaving incubation. I proposed language. I saw a couple of plus ones, but I didn't see too much traffic. Uh, so we can finish up that. So there would be a vote on that towards the end. And then um, I think, Tracy, are you gonna be proposing the template for working groups? Uh, I can talk about that. Uh, I can talk about it, it's fine. Okay. And then uh, Dave, uh, who's be with a proposal to make the fabric bug bounty public? Any other items for the agenda? It's a pretty busy agenda. Um, I did see the, um, the note from the composer team, but uh, the agenda went out before, so that'll get, that'll get picked up next week. All right, so Hackfest planning. All right, uh, thanks, Chris. Um, just really quickly on this, um, the Amsterdam reminder, obviously, uh, but then looking ahead from there, um, there's a, uh, a couple potential events we could co-locate a Hackfest with this fall. Uh, one would be with Open Source Summit uh, North America, formerly LinuxCon, uh, which is going to be in Vancouver. Uh, we could do that right before that event uh, to help with anyone traveling to that and just kind of pull from that broader community. Uh, that would be August 27th, 28th. Uh, another option, um, we will be hosting our annual member summit in Montreal, October 3rd and 4th. Uh, I, I'm sorry, actually October 1st and 2nd, and we could co-locate a Hackfest piggybacking onto that October 3rd and 4th. So we can follow up with a more formal doodle poll for this, but just kind of wanted to gauge from those on the call, is there a hunger uh, to host a Hackfest in that region in these date ranges? Um, if so, we'll get a doodle out, or if there's kind of strong reaction against that, definitely let us know as well. So my own personal preference would be yes to both, um, especially <laughs> the member summit. Um, since many of us will be there anyway, and I think it's a good way of also getting other members to participate for the member summit anyway. Great. Yeah, and then the one, uh, the one other thing I didn't mention in, in uh, the Van Vancouver option, uh, there's a variety of entities there, bc.gov um, and some others that were on the TSC mailing list, interested to partner um, with a variety of things there. Uh, chatted with the Indy folks as well. Um, uh, uh, so other thoughts from the group? Yeah, Todd, we had talked about having in the fall something in Asia. So that if we had it in October, I assume we wouldn't also have one in Asia? Or we'd still try to have one before the end of the year? I don't have a strong opinion. Um, certainly what suits this community best. 
Uh, so, I, know, I mean, my yeah. point is really, if we add one at the end of August, which I'm not especially thrilled about because collides with some vacation plans, but uh, I could possibly <laughs> do this. And, and the point is, you know, we could still have plenty of time to have another event before the end of the year. If we start having an event in October, it's getting yeah. pretty much close to the end of the year. Yep. Uh, that might be the only one we can squeeze in. If we had the Hackfest in August in New York, I'd be happy because I'd go to the U.S. Open. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all have our own little. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Um, aside from those, any other major red flags? Otherwise, we can get a doodle pull out, get gauge interest there, and then also explore um, where we could stack at Asia Hackfest. And yeah. All right. Okay, uh, sounds good. All right, thanks, Todd. All right, so Adrian, Quilt. Hey, how you doing? Good. Is my line okay? Uh, we can. I can hear you fine. Okay, great. Sorry, <laughs> um, wasn't really sure I'm on a DSL line. So um, Quilt has uh, progressed slowly, but uh, has progressed. We had a bit of a. Um, I wouldn't say a hiccup, but we, we had to deal with a bit of a change in direction on the core interledger protocol work in late December, where there was a bit of a um, kind of refactoring or, or, or change in, in the approach. So some of the code we've written had to be refactored quite a bit. And um, so, so set back a little there. Um, unfortunately, not a huge amount of progress on bringing in new contributors. There's one or two um, who are promising and have made some good contributions. Um, but in general, the goal is to continue adding features to the quilt libraries and the quilt um, code base to get sort of feature parity with the JavaScript reference implementation. Um, and we have, uh, we're planning to get involved in the upcoming Hackfests. Uh, we have a, a, a small maintainers kind of face to face get together in about two weeks' time where we hope to um, also push out quite a bit of code uh, to get ourselves to what we would consider a kind of beta um, level um, release. And then uh, the only other issue worth pointing out is Interledger has sort of standardized on uh, conditional payments based only on a SHA-256 hashes. Um, and so we, we're not using the crypto conditions library at all anymore within Interledger. Um, but it's, it's kind of a useful library with uh, interesting functionality. So um, I know Ripple as a company, I'm gonna continue using it internally and open. We're not sure about there. effectively a um, standard library for uh, encoding multi-sig signatures and, and the like. Um, so it's probably not the right forum now to go into detail of what it is, but that's something we'd like to resolve. Uh, whether that maybe there's another Hyperledger project where this fits or uh, whether Ripple should just take it on internally and run it as a sort of Ripple hosted open source project. Um, we kind of open to suggestions on that. Dave and Hart, is this something that we... Oh. Yeah, sorry, I, I was waiting for Hart to jump in here. but um, So I think the current proposal that we've been emailing about is moving it over into the Hyperledger Crypto Library project, um, which is going into the labs. So, um, Okay, yeah. cool. Well, so, um, do, do you want to uh, set up some time for us to talk through that code and what it is and, like, yeah, I mean, what, what the use cases are and so on and see, you know, where... Uh, how best to do that at the moment it's a sub module within so the way the quilt library is set up it's just a single maven repository with a whole bunch of sub modules it's a sub module in there now and we the plan is to pull it out and either put it in its own repo or make it a sub module of some other project um so whatever whatever makes sense for for you guys um probably not something we need to get into details on this call but if we can go away from this call with uh contacts that i can link up with post call to progress that that'd be great yep uh talk to me or heart or both of us actually so yeah we can definitely meet and um 
because we were emailing about this that it, it sounds like the catalyst for getting the first bit of hyperledger code or hyperledger uh, crypto library code together and get the repo out and all that stuff okay so, perfect it's a great okay. opportunity uh, i'll i'll I'll, uh, I'll start a mail between the three of us and anyone else who's interested i can copy them in yeah, great definitely sounds great okay uh any other questions anything else um, on quote that anyone's interested in. Yeah, so hi, Adrian, this is Arno. Uh, hi, so Arno. You, you mentioned a, a pretty significant change. What was it mostly about? What motivated the change? So Interledger um, historically had this idea of payments um, being made through ledgers where you know, the ledger was in within the flow of these Interledger packets. Um, and that was proving to be a problem because it's very difficult to find ledgers that are performant enough to make that really work uh, if your payment has to cross multiple ledgers. Uh, as soon as you have one slow ledger in the, in the chain, things break down. So the, the model has changed to um, make the interledger packet more of an authorization and then to separate out the clearing and settlement. So, you'll see the way it's modeled now. We call it Interledger version four. Um, I don't know why, we went from one to four. There were a few experiments <laughs> that, never, that never really made the light of day. Um, but basically, uh, you know, in the Interledger has this concept of connectors and ledgers. Now the Interledger packets are passed from connector to connector. And then each connector maintains an account with its peers on some ledger, but that's not relevant to the protocol itself how they care and settle on that ledger is is separate it's, it's possible to still tie the two together cryptographically but it's not a requirement interesting and what is the status from a standardization point of view you were trying to push that through aetf is that still current uh yeah so the the specifications around that have started to stabilize somewhat um by that, I mean most of the work is now moved on to other sort of the other parts of the stack. And so we will probably try again in terms of pushing that through a standards process. I'm not sure where that would be. We struggled with IETF just because it's the wrong stakeholder group. Um, most people at IETF are interested in, you know, uh, communication standards more, sort of web and internet. Payments is, is slightly unique in that the stakeholder group is payments people. Um, and the, the, the obvious standards body for payments is SWIFT, but that's not an open standards process um, in, the same, in the same vein right. as ITF or W3C. So we, we're trying to kind of figure that out. Right now we're in the, we're in the sort of mode of we, we, we write the specs, they're published on GitHub, they're open for anyone to implement, we're building implementations, and we'll try and get you know, a network established of people running implementations. And if, if that starts to get some you know, momentum, then the standards effectively become what is implemented in the network. Right. Uh, so, so formal standardization may follow de facto standardization. Yeah, no, that sounds reasonable. I understand the challenge. Thank you. Any other questions for Adrian? Okay, thanks Adrian. Great, thanks. <clears throat> Who's up next, Vipin? Yeah, can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. Because I'm using a new uh, system and sometimes it drops out. Anyway, uh, I, I hope everybody has the um, link to the um, working group update um, which yeah, is yeah i put it in the chat in the yeah, tsc uh, channel uh, yeah obviously i'm not just going to read what is there people can yeah. read it for themselves um, so i'll go through it uh, pretty rapidly because uh, essentially the working group uh, holds audio conferences every two weeks and we have pretty much been stable on zoom um, we have quite a few people who are interested in identity uh, showing up uh, on the calls 
and we out of which uh, there is core group of probably eight or so and uh, we also have a couple of attendees uh, new attendees every session um, and we are a forum uh, for discussions on identity and blockchain identity in particular um, and the main work product, of course, is uh, meant to be the paper and also a possible implementation of an identity uh, module that would allow uh, one, any blockchain uh, implementation that we have currently to uh, use the identity library to uh, to interoperate, help interoperate. So th that is a pretty, uh, you know, stretch goal, so to say. Uh, the the paper itself has been dragging a little bit because uh, you know people uh, show up, uh, but uh, editing the papers proved to be a big. Uh, you know, contributing to the paper uh, is always, uh, you have to, it's like pulling teeth. But uh, I've tried to set up a new uh, model in which um, we uh, ask for volunteers and ask for a quick turnaround. And we notice if some people are not uh, doing, you know, what they're volunteered to do, then we quickly fall back on others. So in the last uh, couple of sessions, we have had a lot of contributions. Uh, and in addition, we also work with others to create paper, you know, papers like GDPR, which are relevant to our uh, mission uh, and on biometrics. Uh, and we have unconference style uh, sort of uh, presentations, uh, impromptu presentations on various topics uh, which deal with identity, uh, especially the, you know, lots of institutions that, or, or uh, let's say conferences or uh, uh, groupings that uh, discuss identity and then uh, the learnings from them, from them, and as to how it applies to uh, blockchain identity in particular. Uh, the identity of the nodes uh, is uh, been, uh, you know, is taken on by the architecture working group. So uh, I also participate there. So we have uh, pretty much similar cast of characters uh, in, in those uh, meetings as well. Uh, in terms of um, the planned work products, we, we want to produce a draft version by, you know, by summer if possible, um, and also plan a, uh, implementation with interface definitions uh, you know in, in a short period of time we really need people from the incubator DLTs to show up uh, to be uh, active in this uh, you know in, in all the work products that we do we do get uh, people occasionally, but most of them are not directly involved with the DLTs that uh, we incubate. So, except for the indie folks, of course, who are uh, much more uh, tied to identity, uh, we rarely have people from, let's say, Sawtooth or Iroha or uh, Quilt or any of those uh, showing up in this identity meetings. And uh, of course the acknowledgements to the most uh, active participants and 
many of the regulars. And any questions for me? Or suggestions? Any comments, questions for Vipin on identity? I would, you know, echo, you know, Vipin to your point about, um, you know, getting uh, broader involvement. Uh, again, I think, you know, this is one of those areas. Um, <clears throat> everybody, everybody needs identity. We're doing, for the most part, we're doing permission blockchain here. It requires identity. And uh, I, I do think that this is maybe um, you know, it is, it is one area that I think um, deserves that we all sort of come to agreement on how we're going to treat identity in our respective platforms. Um, and uh, so I, I, I would encourage, uh, I would encourage some of that participation. I think um, uh, certainly I can say that from an IBM perspective, I think you'll probably see a, a renewed interest in that. We've been sort of, um, we've been on a particular course and I think, you know, we're, we're gonna be doing a lot more around indie. And um, so I think you'll probably see greater participation there. Any other? Oh, I, I did have the, 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 one, the one thing that I did you know, that struck me was you said you were talking about potentially beyond just writing a specification, but also working on an implementation. Would that be, you know, sort of proposing a new project? Is that proposing changes to Indy? How, how do you see that playing out? Yeah, we had discussed this during the creation of the charter. In fact, I think only the identity working group was ever tasked out of all the working groups with uh, mm -hmm. implementation. We had envisaged it as a uh, sort of a thin layer around uh, uh, a elected uh, blockchain solution. Like Dave had some suggestions, for example, saying, why don't we start with something very concrete? Like how do we interoperate between Fabric and Sawtooth, uh, you know, using Indy or using, mm -hmm. uh, you know, an identity utility. So you'd have a, a a layer that would create some kind of an adapter uh, situation where we could uh, use that to do the interoperation. So once you have an adapter from uh, from Fabric to Indy and another one from uh, Indy to Sawtooth or the other, you know, whichever way you want to think about it, mm -hmm. then you have some uh, framework around which you can create this interoperation. And mm -hmm. also, uh, it is possible uh, if, uh, you know, if, if we think about it a little more deeply to even replace the identity framework uh, that is followed in, let's say, Fabric or in uh, Sawtooth with uh, attachments to Indy. Of course, we would need uh, uh, one more thing, which is, you know, a kind of a adapter to legacy systems. In fact, a lot of work is happening in, I, I believe in, uh, in the W3C and other places, uh, the distributed key management systems, the uh, DID, TLS, you know, those kind of things are trying to build that bridge. It is rather ambitious, but I think it is doable, uh, especially if we keep persisting. And I think the reason why some of these things did not come to fruition so far is because uh, we are only uh, starting to uh, uh, get some of these solutions, uh, you know, the DID spec itself was just released uh, last year. And then, uh, of course, uh, there's a whole bunch of people who say, you know, why even bother with DID? Why not use, um, 
you know, the existing legacy stuff, the URNs. So there's both camps and we have to uh, reconcile them. I think Identity Working Group is a place where we can air those concerns and try to reconcile them. Um, you know, so that's another uh, use of this forum. Vipin, um, what's the status of the W3C standards and how are we involved with that and what's our contribution? Um, we do not have a direct contribution to them because you have to show up in those calls again and, you know, or work on, I, I'm just a lurker on the W3C verifiable claim, uh, but the DID spec, you know, uh, we have, several folks from ID who are very active on there. And they're also active in the identity working group and they uh, sort of cross pollinate that thought process uh, with us and also contribute to the paper. Uh, so the vision is shaped by, you know, what's happening outside uh, just the blockchain space or just the uh, hyperledger uh, what is it now called? Not umbrella. What is it? Uh, Dave, what is the new term? Greenhouse. We're using greenhouse. greenhouse. Yeah, greenhouse. So we are going to have uh, plants shooting out the, uh, you know, the openings. The, and it's going to be one of those greenhouses where you go in and you're going to see lots of, lots of growth. All right, thanks, Vipin. Any other comments, questions? If not, we can move on. Maybe we'll actually will get through the agenda. Okay. Uh, next up is uh, many of you will recall that we've had a conversation about, you know, what does it mean to exit uh, incubation? Uh, what does it mean to, can you produce a 1.0 release before you're an active project? What happens if we adopt a project that is already uh, at 1.0, but we incubate it and so forth? You know, what happens in the next release? And so I think the, the agreement that we reached, uh, <clears throat> I need to pull up the link here, put it in the... It, it's in Rocco oh, now. Put it in there. Okay, great. Yep. Um, and so what I did was I updated the release, uh, the, the project lifecycle document to uh, acknowledge, you know, that there's a first major release under the Hyperledger greenhouse um, uh, umbrella. And um, I think that, you know, where we ended up with in our discussion, and I agreed to document it was that basically that a project had to come before the TSC for um, uh, its first major release period, um, whether it's active or passive or deprecated or anything else, uh, it still needed to come and, and sort of make a presentation to the TSC and, and sort of get uh, approval to, to have that major release designation and get the full treatment of Hyperledger from a marketing and PR and everything else perspective. Um, and uh, so I added this uh, step, the stage, if you will, in the life cycle. Uh, I've marked it as a draft since we haven't yet agreed on it, but uh, I think it captures what uh, we had agreed, and that is a project's maintainers seeking to affect a project's first major release, CSEMVR, um, must seek approval of the TSC, whether in active or incubation status as defined above. A project should be in active status prior to such a request, but the TSC may approve such a request if the judgment of the TSC, the code is sufficiently mature to warrant endorsement of the Hyperledger organization. Boom. So, um, comments, questions, suggested edits. Did you incorporate Jonathan's edit? He did a bunch of neat picking. Uh, I was the last person to modify this. His edits are in the mailing list. Oh, I must have missed that. Um, 
<laughs> Sorry, last week was a little bit crazy for me. And I, I don't know if he's on, but the, yeah, they were they were sort of wording things, but it seemed like reasonably important wording things. So okay, I uh, I definitely didn't see that. Where's my where's mail? Otherwise, I can say I wasn't sure that they would fit well in that document, given that it's not exactly about the life cycle. But in the end, I thought what you did is pretty good and it fits well there. And since I don't know where else we would put it, I'm happy with that. Jonathan. Yeah, do we need a standard template for the 1.0 approval like we have for the incubation or the active status? So that's a good question. I had the same, I have to admit. And I saw Simon Stone just sent a request for a composer and he just sent an email. And I was like, should we have a template? I don't know. I don't want to be too administrative or bureaucratic, but. Uh, I think it's, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that it's any different than the active status template. <laughs> um, there, may, there maybe is a few additions around like the um, the badges, right? Like the the CII badge and, and what have you. But I think our main issue with that the active template was where the active template was overreaching was maybe on the community aspect. So maybe it's a, a subset of the active template plus uh, an item or two. Yeah, so maybe one way is kind of reuse the, we could instruct people or recommend that they use it and and just to highlight why they are not, what's the challenge being just active. Yeah, I think that's probably a, a good thing. I'm, the, I guess the thing that I'm thinking is, um, are the, is there anything above and beyond the active template that we would want for 1.0 but not explicitly for active? Like like test coverage and I guess some of that's actually already in the active template. Um, yeah, right. It, I was just thinking it may be useful so that we you know the mile you know the sort of the milestones are clear to those as the people are preparing to come in. And I mean, from what I can tell, Simon pretty much did just that. By the way, huh? he he says, okay, we've got all of these things covered. We're just missing the the community. So it fits exactly the use case we were talking about, which seemed to be unfortunately somewhat common. <clears throat> we did have a discussion yesterday about uh, support of multiple protocols in the uh, architecture working group. Uh, multiple, uh, I'm sorry, but I, I guess I'm drawing what, a what I mean is, uh, you know, for uh, something like Composer, which supports only fabric, uh, you know, we were uh, wondering how not not just it was not just about composer. In fact, it was before the uh, before the uh, uh, proposal to go 1.0 came out, mm -hmm. which was around three o'clock our time, because this was before that. But we were discussing, uh, you know, Cello <clears throat> Explorer, same uh, same questions which uh, seem to come up with uh, depressing uh, regularity. But um, we, we, we were not focused on that aspect, which was more about, uh, you know, how to uh, bootstrap into a multi uh, DLT world. Uh, that was, anyway. That that may not be germane to this discussion, but uh, uh, but I, I was just throwing it out there in case you didn't uh, attend or listen to the discussion. 
Viv and I think where there is um, a connection to what you're saying is this question I think we want to ask ourselves as a community is to what is the obligation of the, on the developers themselves to, <clears throat> in addition to, you know, running a race to a, to a 1.0 release or a 1.1 release, to also be doing the extra work that we know is required to be able to open their process up to um, uh, uh, external developers and to be to be recognizing that it's not just good enough to ship software you also have to be building a community um, I mean it's, it's sometimes a, a little frustrating on the part of the hyperledger staff because it doesn't feel like community is something we can gift <laughs> to uh, to a to a project we can do everything we can to recommend or suggest changes or you know raise awareness um, but ultimately it really is on the, the individual maintainers shoulders to to create the environment and, and to proactively recruit for for new developers onto their project. And so where it's related to your question is what is the obligation on the part of each individual project to look outside its own its its, its own borders and and recruit um, and make that a part of the process. And that's that's where you know I like the fact that in the draft there's language that says, you know, if you do your 1.0 release, you really should be active. And I'm really hoping that it's the exception rather than the rule where we approve a 1.0 release from a project in incubation. But the broader question is where where do we reinforce to developers that they can't just show up the sling, sling code um, aimed to a 1.0 release and then walk away? Um, that there's there's something on their shoulders to broaden that up. Where do we where do we nudge that or, or require that? Yeah, that's that's interesting, Brian. I, you know, one of the, I'm trying to think could what if we did something like if you hit 1.0 and you don't hit active status a year later because you haven't brought community, then you need to uh, roll your project into one of the existing active projects or something like that, right? Because I think that could maybe be the case of, of something like Composer where they hit a 1.0, if, if, you know, they're continuing to march forward on their releases, but, you know, community for whatever reason doesn't want to join that or they're not actively recruiting it, is that better just to become a sub project of say Fabric in the case of, of Composer? I'm just trying to think about how that to put feels, some pressure that feels, on that. Yeah, I mean, that feels a little punitive and a little like, you know, after it's public, to be pulling things back seems really awkward. Um, and instead requiring it before they hit 1.0 is a way of, you know, forcing them to, to deal with it early and to, to, you know, be constructive rather than destructive, right? Because you know, there's right. a downward spiral that you might get into if you're too punitive on a project or, and start pulling them back. So. Yeah. No, at the, at the same time, if you're if you hit 1.0 only supporting one project, you've somewhat ossified uh, your APIs and that sort of things, which may make it difficult for then other projects to uh, integrate with, right? And so that, that's it, not true at all, though. That's not that's not true at all. I mean, uh, I, the, but there is there is uh, I mean, not to rehash last week's conversation, but it does. Um, you know, there's, there's, this is, these are moving trains. These are moving platforms. And the, after 1.0, that suddenly opens up more freedom to be able to go, okay, where, where now should the APIs be modified or, or such on the pathway to a 2.0 to be able to support something, uh, to be able to support a different, different set of needs, a different set of users, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I guess. I guess I'm thinking about sort of um, Explorer as one example, right? Uh, for instance, we have we have a Sawtooth uh, Explorer, um, and there is a Fabric Explorer as well. The Fabric Explorer is under a broader uh, hyper it's under a broader Hyperledger project, right? So that's the one that's meant to be the the sort of open multi-platform one. But today, you know, if you were to look objectively at it it's only because that was sort of positioned that way, right? And so if that one, as we kind of saw in the update on it, is designed around channels and maybe fabric specific features, <clears throat> at what point, I'm just trying to understand about, is can, it kind of just that can first? I propose, or, yeah. Ke Kelly, can I propose that we have a, 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 a have a separate phone call, a separate conversation about ways that we might bring the um, Sawtooth Explorer and, and the, the overall Hyperledger Explorer projects together? Yeah, sure. Just to keep us focused on this. Agenda topic. Okay, I'll try to. I'll, I'll I'll propose that on the TSP list. Okay, so thanks, Brian. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so I, I uh, took a look at Jonathan's pros. Uh, I I made the changes that he suggested. Well, uh, 
three out of the four anyway. Um, yeah, I don't think the first one is correct, by the way. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> so I, 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 I've, I I've, I've rephrased it basically to accommodate his, his word tweaking. Um, I think his was fine. Um, so now it reads a project's maintainer seeking to publish projects first Major release, see Semver, must seek approval of the TSC, whether active or inactive status is defined above. Well, is it expected that most projects will have reached an active status by the time their maintainers seek to announce a first major release, the TSC may approve such requests. Also in cases where um, the project is still in incubation status, should the TSC believe that the project's code is sufficiently mature? If that works. And I, so you can refresh the doc if you've um, got it up. Works for me. Any objections? I don't know if, actually, Todd, do we have quorum? I don't recall. Uh, yeah, we do have quorum now. Okay. All right. So any objections? Okay. If not, then it's approved and I will remove draft. Thanks for driving that, Chris. Yeah. Thanks everyone. And I, I think that's, you know, I think overall that was a generally a healthy thing uh, to, oh, I have to put in a, another state up here. I'll, I'll fix that. Um, okay, um, next up. Um, Tracy, I think, or Brian, one of you was going to review the uh, working group template. And yeah, so sure. I, I I'll, 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 to, okay, Brian, you want to do that? Go ahead, Brian. Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I, there hasn't been a lot of conversation about this, but um, I, on, the, on the list. Uh, so I don't know if we're ready to vote now, um, but that seems that it's generally uncontroversial. But you know, as I mentioned in the email, we, we wanted to have a template for uh, to create um, some new working groups. Uh, for like uh, from a governance or process perspective, we had been a little unclear um, and and before overwhelming you know the TSC with with too many different ways of going about it or our, our own staff with different ways of electing a chair that sort of thing. We thought we just um, proposed kind of a generic template and then. Uh, hopefully, I mean, there's there's maybe three or four different sector specific working groups that we'd like to propose over the next few weeks. Um, uh, and we've already been working with people around them. They'd be <clears throat> modeled after the healthcare working group. Uh, but before delivering that, we thought we'd try to just help help the TSC uh, exercise its oversight um, prerogative by. Uh, trying to be kind of semi-standardized about this. Um, I recognize there's some existing working groups, particularly technical working groups that aren't following this model, which wouldn't, you know, we, we could grandfather all of those um, and maybe converge eventually. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, that was the rationale behind it. And it's got a lot of back and forth amongst the staff, but um, now it's time for a bit of um, back and forth or feedback from the TSC. Or if it looks good um, and you're ready to approve, that would be great too. Yeah, so Brian, um... While there was no comments on the, the mailing list, there were some comments made in the actual document itself um, that we should probably go through and just uh, make sure that we are all on the same page. Okay. So um, I can go I, through I those. Could you go through them? Yeah, definitely. So uh, the first comment that we have is under the work products. Uh, so a question was asked. I suppose we wanted to have a research working group where we discussed new blockchain research and the focus was on learning rather than direct output. Participants might find it quite beneficial even if there were no outputs. Would this have a place as a working group? So I think up until now we've done working groups where um, there's expected to be some sort of output from there, right? Uh, what, what sort of products they might be producing as far as documentation and that sort of thing. Um, are, what does the TSC feel about having working groups that don't produce output or work products? Well, it would be uh, crazy to say that 
there won't be a work product because if it, there is a research working group, they would expect the uh, discussions to be saved as uh, you know audio files. We would expect some uh, something in the meeting minutes. We would expect uh, uh, so you know the we, we would expect let's say there are specific topics of research that are presented, then we would expect some kind of link to those uh, saved either in the meeting minutes or somewhere else. So work product does not necessarily mean just a paper or a implementation. Yeah, but so I think, you know, I think it's a fair point. Uh, I, if you look at W3C, for instance, they have working groups and interest groups. Interest group are essentially discussion forums. And I'm not suggesting to have two different names. I'm happy to make it so that a working group can be said to be essentially about enabling discussion on some topic. And I would think that, you know, we can allow definitely people to propose one such group and then we can look at it and you know on a case by case basis decide whether this makes sense or not and i agree with you vipin that there is typically some kind of traces hopefully anyway in in terms of minutes or if anything else yes i think uh that we should encourage any kind of working group to uh, leave uh, physical traces of what they are doing uh, and take a consistent uh, approach to also reporting to the TSC. Uh, and these should be work products, uh, even those reports to TSC. Okay, um, so I've made a comment to whoever that anonymous person was uh, to note kind of the discussion here. Um, the next comment on here is uh, somebody believes that uh, email uh, should be provided an initial set of emails for those initial participants. Um, if somebody else says it's considered PII and thus uh, shouldn't be there for anti-spam reasons. Yeah, that was me with the second comment. I apologize. Um, oh, so cool. Just an attempt to try to <clears throat> not scare people away by saying, well, your email address is going to be on a public document then. I mean, hopefully everyone contributes and then chooses to reveal their, their um, email address. But uh, uh, I just have had pushback a little bit from, you know, long public lists of email addresses. So, I don't know. Maybe that's archaic. <laughs> But I guess we're not forbidding people from <laughs> putting their email address if they want to, and the template seems to be saying this, and I think that's maybe what triggered the whole thing. I think it should say that it should at least have the names and organizations or affiliations of those people. That's about it. So I guess I'm... <clears throat> I guess I'm struggling with the, 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 the whole concept of initial participants. Um, yeah, I, agree. I, I, I think, you know, maybe there needs to be some evidence of interest. Um, and so you can have maybe sponsors, you know, so others that are willing to sort of say, yeah, I think this is important and we should do this. Um, I agree it shouldn't be emails, um, but... Um, no, but that's a list of people who say, hey, if you create this, I will participate. I, I wouldn't call that. it initial participants because it's not necessarily the case, but I would say sponsors. I mean, that's what we've done with other projects is we say, what are the project sponsors? It's a bit different. I would say maybe there's a different name, but... Uh, yeah. Interested yeah, parties, we can make it if you want. Interested parties or something like this. Exactly, it's intended to show that there's support for it, um, uh, right. because we're not we're not blessing you know specific named participants as like a committee of, of some sort. Um, it's just here's the people who said they'll join the list, and and 
participate in the conversation, um, which is a lower threshold than when we're looking for sponsors for a project. Um, you yes. know, as individuals, we still expect, yeah, yeah, that's a more major okay. commitment. But so, looking, happy for a different name than participant. Interested parties seems like a good uh, compromise. So the next sections sort of cover elections and initial chair and so forth. Um, in, the, in, the, in the past, um, uh, it's been pretty evident somebody, you know, has an interest in championing the idea and they come forward and they do the legwork to make a proposal and gather interest and 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 I've been of the uh, you know I think in, in most cases the the individual who did all that legwork has been the one that um, gets to be the chair um, and 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 I, I guess I'm a little bit I'm, I'm a little bit concerned a bit with all subscribers of the working group's mailing list as of the date get to vote on the chair. Um, there's an awful lot of people that are just passive. Um, and <clears throat> I'd be um, worried about, again, I, I, don't get me wrong, but I've seen this happen in other places where something just gets gamed. Subscribing to a mailing list costs nothing there's no investment required. You can cancel at any time. And all of a sudden you're going to ram somebody in his chair because you've got, you know, you were made, you were able to sort of convince all your colleagues at work to vote for you. Um, I don't think that's too cool. I actually think that the chair of a working group should be chosen by the TSC. Yeah, it was an, uh, um, an attempt to try to crowdsource it and, and have yeah, the, I, I, um, that working group feel like they have some ownership over it. One, one idea we floated, by the way, was the idea of having the subscribership um, to that working group as of, say, a month or two prior, so that the odds of it being gamed at the last minute were low, um, or even a week or two prior. Um, you know, uh, so lot, last minute gaming wasn't really going to be easy, um, but uh, uh, yeah, well, you know, all I, the process be gamed. I, I, I'll tell you the story about what happened with OpenStack in the early uh, elections for the uh, uh, technical committee, uh, and it was game. Uh, I won't mention the company, but it was totally gamed, and it was well in advance. I mean, they 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 planned it out. What can I say? It was stupid, and everybody knew what certainly, they did. Certainly, certainly for they, didn't, they paid the price thing. for it. So. I, I again, I, I think that I, I think you know the TSC should. Um, I think the TSC. Here's, here's just two things I'd say in response to that it is um, for the for something like electing the TSC, we have that filter of being a contributor, right? And that's that's a that's still a it's a non-zero thing, yep. right? And yep. um, and meaningful, no no question, no challenge to that. Being a chair of a working group is actually going to be a fair bit of work and a yes, fair sir. bit of expectation. And, and, and we will actually ride herd a little bit on the, on these chairs, right? And if they underperform, it's going to be obvious in front of a large influential crowd. And so to some degree, if someone really wants to be chair so much so that they talk, you know, 10 of their coworkers into joining the mailing list, um, you know, I, I, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll put the duocracy kind of burden on, on this to a large degree, I think. Um, I, I, I and, and, and on the other hand, it feels a little like, like, it's a low. It's a, it's it's a, it's a low level of the stack. It's not really a lot of power, um, and and so I thought the risk of it being gained would be pretty low. I I had mixed feelings on this. Um, on one hand, any subscriber to the mailing list, and I had put a question in there: Does the do the people who vote have to be members of Hyperledger, or can anyone vote because they're on the mailing list? Um, but the other thing was. You know, people can be on the mailing list and just say, oh, I can go vote. And they've never been to a meeting, don't know what's going right. on, and they just vote. Um, you know, so is it active participants? Um, but the flip side of that is someone may not be active because they don't like the way the chair is doing something. So. I think there, there, there is a big question of, uh, definitely of how do we phrase it and we, I think that's on TSC of choosing the chair 
uh, for each and every working group uh, is a lot of a, a big of an ask from TSC because if we think of scaling it, moving forward, if we start launching more of those groups. Uh, we ask the TSC to attend most of those calls on a weekly or bi-weekly basis uh, to understand how the chairs are performing. Um, and there, we envision launching at, at least three, probably four uh, vertical working groups. That's a lot. Um, so I'm not sure if this is something that TSC wants to take on from uh, an effort perspective. Uh, you are right that uh, probably active participant participation would be better than just subscribing to the mailing list, but how do we measure that? Um, is mailing list the right place uh, or is it active on the calls because someone not necessarily wants to be just active on the, on the mailing list is, an, is another thing. That's why we kind of went ahead and said, let's choose everyone who's subscribed to the mailing list and we will be able to monitor, you know, last minute uh, subscribers as well. If we see all of a sudden huge jump in subscriptions, we are able to uh, then point out these people and kind of behind the uh, door um, point them out and resolve that issue uh, rather than uh, deal with other aspects uh, if we choose other mechanisms. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, I, I don't know that we have, maybe there is a problem where I don't know, I'm not aware of, but I mean, we have had working groups for over two years in existence. We never had this election process for the chairs. They kind of came about naturally because they were, as Chris mentioned, they were at the leading front of proposing the working groups. They volunteered. And as far as I know, they're doing a good job. We see those updates now. They are stepping up to make that happen. And I don't know, it feels a little bit to me like we're solving a problem that doesn't exist. And maybe in doing so, we are going to create a new one, which is along the lines of what Chris was mentioning, some kind of gaming if somebody wanted to. And so... Tell you what, because we're at time, why don't, um, and because there has now been conversation on the um, Google Doc, why don't we commit to um, continuing the conversation on the TSC list and, and in comments here, and we will try to tee up here are the three or four open questions and then bring them back to next week's TSC meeting. And if we can, you know, pose them as yes, no, or, or kind of, you know, option A, option B, then maybe we can come to a close by next week's call. Does that sound good? Yes, it does. And great. This is these are all great job, comments. So thanks again, everyone. Another packed agenda. And uh, next week, uh, we'll put, <laughs> Dave, we'll put you up top. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's been three weeks now, so uh, we'll put. You I up appreciate that. The, uh, the composed uh, deadline is is approaching fast, April seventeenth. Yeah, we'll put you up top, and then uh, we'll have the uh, fabric and performance and scaling working groups, and then we'll have composer. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, and talk at y'all soon. Thanks.